Um, so, uh, a short intro. My name is Daniel Dunn. I just told you that I'm a, a new senior lecturer here. I don't know how long I get to say that. I figure maybe my first year, and then I'll stop saying it. Uh, and um, I'm a spatial ecologist by training. I came here from uh, Duke University, where I was an assistant research professor. Um, I've done a lot of um, a lot of my background is in dynamic ocean management. Some of you might have caught the talk um, that I gave on Friday at the. the um, Center for Marine Sciences Talk Fest. That was a lot of fun. Um, and I sort of transitioned from uh, work on specifically on spatial management and marine protected areas to think more broadly about area-based management tools and how we use them in a specific geography, in this case, in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, and maybe this is just by way of introduction and I'm also talking specifically to the HDR um, uh, folks here. Um, a lot of this comes about because of opportunity, and then opportunity results in weird things and just uh, doors opening and your eyes opening about the way things work. And we have a lot of assumptions that we work with to begin with um, that, you know, once you get an opportunity, you realize, wait a second, this is not at all the way it works. And you think, you think things like these big UN conventions are these amazing groups that do amazing things, and when in fact when you go there, they're insanely boring and frankly do nothing for decades at a time, half the time. Um, and so I think we have a lot of assumptions and it's these opportunities that, that open up that allow us to sort of um, take those next steps in our, our career. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today was entirely based on the fact that um, towards the end of the, the census of marine life, when I worked at Duke University, uh, um, we needed somebody to sort of participate in a convention on biological diversity meeting and talk to them about EBSAs, which I'll talk about today, ecologically or biologically significant areas, and how the, all the information coming out of the census of marine life could feed into um, descriptions of these important areas, and nobody wanted to do it. So everybody's like, I don't have time to do that. I, I, this is, uh, is there a paper coming out of this? No, no paper. Oh, I'm not going to do that. Um, that was 10 years ago, and since then, it's, it's been an incredible um, journey, but it, it's all because I bothered to do that one thing um, that nobody wanted to do and created content, which nobody creates, that got used and used and used again to the point that I'm actually kind of um, embarrassed when I see the content that I developed 10 years ago, but, but it's still flogged out there. Um, illustrations that were developed to show people how to do something. Um, writing paragraphs for the Convention on Biological Diversity on what biological diversity was, which was ridiculous for me to be doing that at the time, but nobody else was doing it in this particular context. So you get those opportunities and you kind of run with them, and that's what I'm gonna talk about um, today. So this is just to get your attention. It would have worked much better if it was like an enormous uh, version of it, but it's, it's close enough. Um, so don't let the thing to get you here is, uh, is the point. Um, all right, so what I'm gonna talk about today is an overview of what areas beyond national jurisdiction are um, and biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. If you saw my um, seminar when I was applying for this position, there'll be a few some uh, familiar slides, um, but some new ones and uh, then going into this system, migratory connectivity in the ocean system, um, and spending a lot of time on that, and ending with a gratuitous plug um, for my work and hopefully collaborations with anybody and everybody who's interested in this topic. Okay, so first of all, what are areas beyond national jurisdiction? Can I just get a show of hands? Who knew before you saw this email that there was a term called areas beyond national jurisdiction and knew what it was? All right, that's good, that's like half. Okay, that's pretty much expected. So it's 200 nautical miles from shore. Right, we think about things here in the Australian context um, and the Australian EEZ, um, and basically, you know, every other country has something similar. But there's an entire area beyond that, and we kind of don't really think about it. When we think about it, we're like, oh, there's nothing there, um, and it's not that big anyway. But it turns out it's 47% of the planet's surface. Right, it's half the planet, and it's probably more than 90% of the habitable volume of the planet. So we're talking about absolutely astronomical um, areas of volumes. Uh, which deserve conservation, or at least consideration, just as much as the rainforest right next to us, um, you know, going down the Lamington and seeing all the wonders there. You know, that's deserving of protection. So are these areas. It's just that we don't, we're not engaged with them, we don't act, interact with them that much, and so we don't think about them that much. Okay, some quick benefits and challenges of, of areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, uh, this might be a stretch depending on how you describe uh, define uh, biodiversity. But we have lots of definitions for biodiversity. And if you think about biodiversity from the perspective of, of um, genetic diversity or functional diversity, I could argue that the areas beyond national jurisdiction, the open ocean and deep seas, have uh, more 
um, diversity than rainforests do in certain circumstances. When you get things, everything from chemosynthetic uh, vents and the, the types of creatures that are able to have their heads in, uh, what is it, like 200 degree waters and their butts in, two, in negative two degree waters, that's something that you're not going to find in the rainforest, right? These are there's a diversity there that doesn't exist in other places because of the incredible pressure and um, uh, temperature extremes that they're enduring. Um, there's also worth uh, a ten billion dollar fishery uh, out there. Um, Ninety percent of global trade goes across these oceans in some way. Um, it's the largest untapped source of minerals. This is a huge deal right now. Deep sea mining. Um, you might have seen some articles on this recently. There's a huge push when you think about the problems that we're having on land. We can see those problems. Nobody wants those problems in their backyard. Um, people these days are getting more and more offended by putting them in another country and doing the mining in a different country. So where are you going to do it? Eventually, you're going to throw it someplace you can't see it at all, like in the deep sea. Um, there's also arguments that are being made about whether it's uh, um, less uh, polluting to do it in the deep sea. Maybe you don't have the same... Um, uh, problems with uh, slavery in the deep sea, actually. Slavery in the high seas is a really big problem. Um, so that for lots of reasons, there's a sort of push away from EEZs um, towards thinking about using um, mineral resources in, in areas beyond national jurisdiction. It's also the backbone of the internet. Every time you log on, the only reason you can do that is because we've got cables going across the seafloor. Um, uh, and similar to the minerals, it's also um, a completely ungoverned and un uh, largely untapped um, resource for um, uh, reservoir of genetic resources, and they're currently negotiating how to deal with that and who's actually responsible for it. Who's allowed to go out there and, and identify these um, genetic resources and make use of them? Who benefits from that? Um, we've sort of established that. We have established that with the Zagoya Protocol uh, on land. We have nothing in areas beyond national jurisdiction. You get a boat, you go out there, you find something, you can make what you want of it, and it's, it's yours to do with what you want right now. Um, it's also the you know has huge climate regulation implications. Uh, the largest sink of heat in the, in uh, in a warming world, and these are things we really need to consider. Um, there are big challenges though. This is you know as we know one we just don't think about it that much because it's deep and distant and dynamic, um, because it's under huge pressure. Um, because it, I mean like I said it's it's so huge. We're talking 168 times the volume of habitat that we have on land, uh, which makes it the least. Um, sampled and the least protected ecosystem on the planet, by far. And I'll give you some figures for that. Um, it's also a global common, commons, right? This is an area that's not regulated by a single country. It's where countries have to agree how to utilize things, and they're allowed to take exceptions for the most part, which basically means that most countries can uh, think that they can kind of do what they want in most circumstances. Um, and it's not just that. It's also super confusing governance. Um, it's governed under both the common heritage of mankind, which basically suggests that we need to share profits, as well as the freedom of the high seas, which basically says if you can get there, you can take it. Right? So how do you deal with those things when the water column is the freedom of the high seas, but the seafloor is you're supposed to share everything? Right? It, it gets, uh, it's pretty confusing. Um, so in that context, um, we're also seeing a lot of interest and an increasing use of areas beyond national jurisdiction at rates that actually exceed a lot of um, EEZs. Uh, so in this case, we have a really sort of typical um, view of what happens with fisheries landings and catch over uh, since 1950, which basically it sort of tops out about 1980 or so, right? Fisheries catches and uh, landings and volume. However, our fishing effort continues to increase really drastically and continues to this day to increase. So we're catching the same amount of fish, and we're putting a lot more effort into the ocean. A lot more nets, a lot more lines, to catch the same amount of fish. Um, we're also trying to catch that fish deeper and deeper all the time. Right? We're, we're fishing out seamounts, we're going for the next deeper seamount, and we keep going deeper and deeper into the ocean. Uh, and it's not just fisheries. Um, oil and, and gas exploration, same thing. There are not too many places in areas beyond national jurisdiction where you would explore for oil and gas, but at this point, um, you can the uh, um, oil and gas production depth and uh, exploration depth is just about 3,000 meters, which is approximately the average depth of the ocean. Right? So there's not a whole lot of places in the ocean right now that you might not be able to get to um, uh, if you were looking for oil and gas, or in this case, they're also working at um, deep sea mining at 4,000 meter steps where they're trying to put some, some gear down into the middle of the Pacific. Um, uh, so uh, this is um, uh, exploration contracts for deep sea mining starting in about uh, 2005, exponential increase from about 10 to 26 or 27 exploration contracts, huge contracts. We're talking 75,000 kilometers square contracts individually. 
um, for a number of them um, going through the roof. Same thing with a lot of uh, the shipping trade. And at the same time, these two, the yellow and blue one here, those are cumulative um, uh, species discovered for um, crustaceans and nematodes. And all you need to gather from, from this is that basically about 40 or 50 percent of the known crustaceans and nematodes have been found uh, since 1995, right? So these, this, is, this is a new territory. In the last 25 years, we've discovered half of the species we know of some of these, uh, um, some of these taxa. That's incredible. So increasing use of an area that we know nothing about, and we're just beginning to understand the full under, uh, scope of biodiversity in these regions. So you would think maybe it would be wise to protect some of that so we can go out and think about it and look at it and figure out what's actually there before we use it. Um, Everybody here is familiar with the, the IG uh, Target 11 and uh, the, the Sustainable Development Goals and the efforts to um, conserve uh, through marine protected areas and the like, um, or protected areas, um, and reach these targets. Uh, the target is 17% on land, it's 10% uh, in the ocean. And within EEZs, they've actually done a really good job of that. Really mostly in the last five or six years, there's been a huge increase in that. Okay? So we're past, theoretically past the, the point within exclusive economic zones. Um, but you get to A, B, and J. These figures are maybe six months old, so don't, don't hold me to, to them, but they're very close. I think it's about 1.2 or 1.25 now um, in areas beyond national jurisdiction. 1% of the ocean beyond national jurisdiction has been conserved compared to what we've done within national jurisdictions. Um, think about your, your, your preferred habitat, right? If for a particular species, uh, right? Like, what if 1% of rainforests were currently conserved? How do you think we feel about that? Pretty shitty. I don't think we feel very good about it. Um, and, but we don't, we're not contemplating it. In fact, it's, we ignore it so much that the, the person in charge of the program at work at the CBD actually declared victory when we reached 10% in EEZs. It's like, hey, we did it. We got 10% in EEZs. We did what we were supposed to do. It's like, that, that's not even, that's like, a third of the ocean, less than a third of the ocean that you're talking about. Um, and so overall, that actually brings the total number way down uh, for the percent coverage of the ocean down to um, seven, seven and a half per percent. Um, so we've got increasing use, low levels of protection, and it's exacerbated or maybe caused uh, by huge governance gaps. Um, and these gaps can be uh, geographic gaps in governance. So in this case, we have um, regional fishery management organizations, obviously managing fisheries. Um, this is in the uh, seafloor, this is um, benthic uh, and small pelagic fisheries, and this is for um, pelagic fisheries, largely tuna types of fisheries. The light blue here are areas that have no governance structure whatsoever. Nobody's governing fishing in those areas, um, right? So most of the Atlantic, there is no gov nobody that's actually governing and has, um, uh, can dictate uh, quotas and the like uh, for deep sea fisheries. Um, and you, it looks okay on the pelagic side, but I want to I come back to that in the next slide. The other problem is, is that you need a partner, right? So you've got industries um, and governance of industry, but you need an environmental partner. These are regional seas organizations, which are sort of the regional equivalent um, for environmental management. Only three or four of these, depending on whether you, you count the Mediterranean as having areas beyond national jurisdiction, actually have a mandate beyond national jurisdiction. So for the vast, vast majority of the ocean, there's no environmental partner. So there's nobody out there whose first and primary job is to worry about biodiversity and whether we're conserving biodiversity. Uh, that's, that's a big problem. Um, okay, so what I was gonna say about the pelagic side is it's not just geographic gaps, it's also taxonomic gaps. It looks like the ge the ge we're covering the geography perfectly, um, but in fact, if you look at OBIS, which is Ocean Biogeographic Information System, which is the largest warehouse of marine observations in the world, um, it has observations of 4,000, I think, and 32 maybe species of fish in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Right? This covers all of those fish. Of those, these are the percentage by basically depth and distance from shore uh, that are have been assessed. Right? And only in one circumstance do you get more than 10%. And for the large majority, it's far less than 10% of those fish are assessed. In fact. Is something like 3% of fish species in areas beyond national jurisdiction have some level of assessment. We have some idea of what their populations, um, what might be happening to their populations. Um, that's pretty incredible in my opinion. Okay, so <laughs> this should raise one big question, which is sort of like, 
all right, who is actually governing these systems? Like, what's the problem here? Why, why is this the, the case? Why don't we have conservation areas? Uh, why do we have these gaps in, in governance? And it, it's the UN. This is all under a UN, UN structure. And this is the very tidy uh, <laughs> schematic of governance of areas beyond national jurisdiction and all the entities that have some level of, of participation in those. Um, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that kind of says it all right there. But um, it, the main ones here are, are shipping, um, a number of biodiversity conventions, uh, a number of things related to fisheries and mining. Um, cables actually have no governing body. Nobody tells the cable companies what to do and what not to do in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, and there's some other um, sort of upcoming things um, like uh, um, mariculture, where nobody really knows Nobody knows whether it's the responsibility of the fishery management organizations or who to deal with that if somebody wanted to just start doing mariculture in the middle of the ocean. Um, there's also a, a bizarre homesteading movement where there's some billionaires who think that the best idea for uh, running away from taxes is to build a floating city somewhere in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So there's some really weird things happening. Um, and you know, lately, weird things happen when you don't want them to happen, I would say, in, particularly in politics. Uh, so we can't trust that it's just not going to happen because it would be stupid to do that. It will happen, um, and we have to prepare for it. Uh, so one interesting thing is that a lot of these organizations um, are thinking about area-based management and are thinking about biodiversity and trying to understand why, where biodiversity is in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Each one of these, um, so the International Seabed Authority deals, I can't use the... Uh, International Seabed Authority deals with um, deep sea mining. They're the sole organization that gives out leases, um, exploration leases at this point, but I would say in the next five, maybe 10 years, um, exploitation leases for deep sea mining. Um, they have things called areas of particular environmental interest. This gets more Dr. Seuss as you go through them. Um, uh, UNESCO has World Heritage Sites. They put out a, um, a report about a year or two ago on uh, it's time for having to develop World Heritage Sites in areas by national jurisdiction. Um, regional fishery management organizations have been and, uh, developing and are, are maybe the best example of developing area-based management tools in areas beyond national jurisdiction, and those are vulnerable marine ecosystems, largely cold water coral reefs that once they've been identified, they're supposed to stay away from. Um, the International Maritime Organization governs shipping and pollution. They have particularly sensitive sea areas, it's my favorite one, uh, and there are none of them in areas beyond national jurisdiction, though there's nothing stopping them from doing it. Um, they just haven't put any of them forward. Um, these are all assessments down here in negotiations, uh, but I want to get at one in particular here, which is the, the CBD's process for describing ecologically or biologically significant areas, EBSAs. Okay, so what is an EBSA? Um, an EBSA, an ecologically or biologically significant area, is an area described to meet specific criteria. Um, in CBCS, we do a lot of conservation planning, right? Um, I'm really excited to be here because I'm learning a lot because my focus has been very marine oriented and a lot of times things on the terrestrial side have, been, have moved well beyond what we're doing. So it's great for me to be here and, and learn about that. Um, and I think hopefully we can bring some of what's been happening in the marine realm into the picture as well. This is one of the, the main efforts on the marine, in the marine realm side to develop information that can help inform um, spatial planning uh, by countries and um, intergovernmental organizations. The interesting thing here is that it's the only intergovernmentally sanctioned process to identify important ecological areas in the ocean, right? There is no other process uh, where countries have come together and said, these are important areas. We all agree that these are important areas. Um, that has two, two, two sort of underpinning points there. One is it's a political process, right? So the results, if you ever take a look at them, are extremely varied. Uh, and I wouldn't say they were all ecologically important. Um, uh, but uh, the, the, the rub is that that same political process actually gives them traction where they wouldn't have it otherwise. Um, so that's, that's kind of why this thing is, is so important. What's um, frequently confused is people say EBSAs now and everybody thinks MPAs. Like, oh, these are important areas. They've done something. They have, it has some management implication. It has no management implication whatsoever. Um, They've tried to be very, very clear that this is an, a technical information gathering exercise uh, and that the, there is no implication that comes with it. However, these are basically hammers that are being handed out to countries and to NGOs that want to use them in other fora to try to ask other fora why they're not 
um, using this information why they're doing something in this area that has been described as an EBSA. Um, and it, uh, if anybody wants to chat with me afterwards, there are lots of examples of how that's already happened and, and continues to happen. Um, sorry, these are the, the this is the criteria suite that they use uh, to identify um, EBSAs. Uh, and they went through a really extended process of pulling together criteria suites and thinking about them to, to develop these. And they're meant to be very high level and um, uh, basically incorporate other criteria suites because they knew that they didn't have management implication themselves and it was only in their ability to relate to another criteria suite that they would be used. So these are super general for that, that reason. Um, uh, I'm just gonna throw one more note in there for the um, conservation planning um, geeks here. This is the first time in the marine realm, and I'm curious what's happened in the, in the terrestrial realm, but when they developed these um, criteria, these are site criteria, and it's the first time in the marine realm where they separated out site criteria and network criteria. You don't see representativity, um, you don't see connectivity in here, and the point is that these are individual sites. The network criteria are actually in the next annex down, which is how to identify networks of um, protected areas, basically. And they have a suite of, of five criteria specific to networks. Um, and that's pre been pretty interesting and very useful to be able to do that and say what's the difference between solely an ecologically important area and these networks more broadly. Um, yeah, so I got to that point, how, the, how else they can be used. All right, so the EBSA process is, uh, um, it's a process, right? They go through these regional workshops. Um, they start with regional workshops. That's meant to fit into a repository and then the subsidiary body of scientific, technical, and technological advice uh, votes up or down on it and sends it on to the conference of parties who says, who is supposed to endorse it, and then it's supposed to go on to the UNGA. Didn't actually happen this way. However, the information actually ends up making it to those other entities anyway. Um, the other part, and they've, they've done this uh, through 14 workshops um, so far, and they've come up with over 300 sites. I think it's 321 or two, um, covered 80. Um, it's been a huge success, one of the biggest success that the CBD has noted to date, particularly on the marine side, um, if not just in general. Uh, and, and this information is being used pretty widely. Um, for me, I got to participate in a number of these. Uh, the workshops were um, uh, supported by either the Duke Marine Geospatial Ecology Lab or CSIRO. Um, we, so either one of those two groups supported all 14 workshops, and I got to participate in a, in, in a few of these. And, one of the things that I noticed was that these workshops are closed workshops. They're invitation only. Invitation goes out to the country. Country nominates um, an expert or a few experts. They all come to the meeting, and it's experts in the room who are um, the people who are filling out the templates and deciding what's an EPSA and what isn't an EPSA, and then that workshop report goes out. Nobody contributes any information after that. You're not allowed to go out and get more information once you've decided on an area to better fill in the template. It's all done in a week-long meeting with the people in the room. Okay? I don't care how good these people are, I don't care how many people you manage to get into a single conference room, there's no way that they can possibly have the scope of information necessary to fill out those templates. Um, and it's actually nowhere, nowhere near that good. There may be 30 people in the room most of the time, um, and their knowledge is highly variable. Their interest level is highly variable. Um, I hate to say it, but the Israeli representative <laughs> Man, that guy was on vacation. He had to call home and get some other people to fill out the templates for him because he didn't realize he was supposed to do it. Uh, there's some, there's some really funny examples. Who was it? Uh, I can get you the name, but it was pretty funny, um, right? So they're all over the place, and this is a you know a developed country that has interest in the in the in um, in how this uh, process moves forward. Um, so you can imagine in, in some of the undeveloped uh, underdeveloped uh, countries, developing countries. Um, so you, you, you're basing it entirely on the experts in the room and entirely on the data groups that are trying to support the, the workshop. And those people are basically going to reach out in a couple of months that they have to the people that they know, to their friends. This is George Schillinger's uh, um, leatherback uh, track data, right? It's been all over the place. Even George, who is a friend, we had to use the figure from his paper because we couldn't actually get him to give us the data, right? This is, this is another example where they happen to um, know a particular sea turtle uh, biologist who gave his, uh, I think, was it loggerhead um, uh, data for off the, the coast of um, um, uh, Oman and the Arabian Sea and the like. Um, and that's how data gets into the system, right? It's basically like 
the dozen researchers that I know that happen to work in the region, or maybe they send out an email to somebody else and they bring them into the, the process. That's an insanely inefficient way to do this, and it makes me a little bit embarrassed about the results and embarrassed about the information in these things. And it's, it, frankly, it's just not acceptable to me, particularly when I have to stand up in front of people and tell them about EBSAs and tell them about the utility of EBSAs, because they're really useful, but they're extremely um, information poor compared to what they could be if we actually had access to the knowledge that's being generated by academics and researchers in general. Okay, so, and it's not just EBSAs. Every single one of these processes done the same way. There's not a single one of them that has a, you know, some sort of reservoir of knowledge that's been generated by researchers. Maybe the International Whaling Commission is the only one that seems to have like an extraordinarily, extraordinary group of experts working with them um, over a long period of time. And even, even IWC doesn't have a portal that has the information that those researchers are bringing in. They're still dependent on the researchers showing up to the meeting to put the information into the system. That's crazy. Um, so this brings me to arriving at UQ and trying to think about you know, what I want to do a little bit different than what I was doing at Duke. Um, and, and this is it in a nutshell. It's I'm tired of the knowledge that we're generating sitting in figures and papers as opposed to um, everybody just contributing data, maybe. Um, but the, the figures, the model results sitting in, our, uh, in the papers, and people, myself included, having to go back to papers to create summaries of what types of pelagic biodiversity exist in, um, in the North Atlantic. I had to do that a month and a half ago. I had to go back to do a literature review and pull figures from papers to do that. That's crazy. Um, and it, so one of my main um, foci here is on trying to turn the tide on access to this type of knowledge and starting to aggregate knowledge rather than, than just data. And that's what I want to talk to you about now. So the second part of this is all about the migratory connectivity in the ocean system, um, which is sort of my first effort, or I should say there were some, some other efforts that I've done, the fishing effort and things like that. But the first real effort to, to think about this and create a system that might be able to house some of this information. Um, so the first question is, is, what is migratory connectivity? I suspect this is pretty um, uh, comfortable territory for most of you, but it's essentially the, the, the geographic linking of individuals and populations throughout their migratory cycle. So um, in, in this case, we have a, um, a, a Cory Shearwater, a couple of colonies off of Spain and um, uh, Northwest Africa, uh, migrate to three different places. Uh, they either go up to the Northwest Atlantic off the coast of Brazil, or down to South Africa, either side of South Africa. Um, right? that, that connectivity between uh, uh, breeding areas and foraging areas um, is essentially what we're talking about, and then the return trip the other way. Um, this is really, in, is really critical for uh, conservation. And you know, this question came up um, in James's lab session on, uh, um, on the global biodiversity framework. And you know, what's, what's all this talk about connectivity? And, and aren't we doing too much with connect, ecological connectivity? Um, is, is it overblown? I, you know, I, I felt like there was a little bit of pushback on this. And I'm curious about that, because for me, it's pretty abundantly obvious. If you have populations, Right? In this case, that are um, connected, a single breeding population connected to loads of, of uh, foraging areas, you lose one of the foraging areas, that population probably still going to do pretty well. You have strong, or weak, uh, strongly connected populations where you have one breeding area and one foraging area, and you lose the foraging area, you lose the population. Right? That connectivity, the strength of connectivity there, is absolutely critical for conservation of those populations. Um, ecological connectivity, migratory connectivity is critical both in understanding how protected area networks are going to conserve populations, um, as well as just thinking about the individual populations themselves and what other um, uh, what the implications are of activities in one spot uh, for the population as a whole. We have written a lot about migratory connectivity, right? And we did a, a systematic literature. We're in the process of doing a systematic literature review since 1990 for marine mammals, fish, sea turtles, and seabirds. Uh, and in those 30 years, I guess, <laughs> um, 12,000 papers, right? And, and it's actually not till 2020. This is only till, I think, uh, uh, 2016 or 2017, and it's you know, exponential, so it's, it's gonna be well over 12,000. Huge, huge number of papers. Um, and of those, about 13, uh, 1,300 of them have been um, telemetry papers, satellite telemetry papers, and there's a point there. So 
this is the type of information that I'm that, that I'm saying we're producing loads of, right? In this case, I want to go back to Cory Shearwater and give you an example of, of how much we know about Cory Shearwater. So Cory Shearwater, we know <coughs> um, what portion of the population go to different destinations um, along their migratory cycle, right? Whether they go to the Northwest Atlantic, uh, Brazil, or South Africa, um, by colony, right? We know how, how much time they spend over the entire um, year at each of those places. We know the phonology, the timing of it, right? This is 14 March plus or minus 11 days, right? That's when they, what is that, like when they exit um, the migratory stage, basically when they're coming back to the, the, the breeding area or when they're leaving the breeding area. Um, we know the routes that, <coughs> that they take, and we know the, the sort of area use along those routes, the more important area use. Now this is, a bit, this is a kind of strange example, and I probably shouldn't use it for two reasons. One, there have been papers since then that show that they actually change quite a bit. So didn't put that one in there. The other one is that they've actually taken this information and gen or taken these data and generated some information products that people can use, which is pretty unusual for anything other than seabirds. Um, we don't really have them for marine mammals. We've just started to actually to make them for marine mammals. We don't have them at all for um, sea turtles, and we don't have them at all for fish. But in this case, BirdLife International has developed a general distribution, as well as, if you can see them, super tiny little um, important bird areas for uh, the species. Um, what this still doesn't have, though, is connectivity between those important bird areas. You have no idea if you lose um, a, a foraging area down here that it's going to impact um, an important bird area up here. Uh, so that connectivity still doesn't exist there. And also, how they're using the area and the timing doesn't exist there. So we've actually been working with BirdLife on MICO. They're one of our main partners to try to help provide that extra complementary piece of information. And it's, it's not just these, these, the information in the papers that sort of goes missing or um, that maybe isn't being utilized the way it should be. Um, we love to talk about sharing data. I think sharing data is critical. Uh, um, you know, open access is extremely important. We have lots of data warehouses where people put tracking um, and data, and that's great. Last week, I was at the Convention on Migratory Species. There were 50, maybe 60 people in the room for the presentation on MICO, and I asked how many of them had ever gone to a data warehouse and downloaded some data or even looked at the data um, and utilized it in some way. One person in the room raised their hand, okay? Data doesn't get transferred to knowledge brokers in that manner. It just doesn't happen, right? Policymakers are not gonna go to these sites and look at the information and put it into their uh, their next intervention on the floor or something like that. Not even their lackeys are gonna, uh, going to do that. Um, and we also have a problem where sometimes we lose a data warehouse, right? SeaTurtle.org was the biggest sea turtle, not just sea turtle, but probably marine-oriented um, telemetry tracking site uh, for years. Hasn't been updated in years. The tool that they use uh, to help um, analyses still exists. People still go to it, but it's, it's essentially non-functional and whether those data are, are, how those data get migrated into other um, uh, uh, um, databases is, is a big question. Uh, so we need to be careful about this for a couple of reasons. One, how we assume, or what we assume is happening when the data go into these things, and how well uh, uh, people are using them, as well as making sure that the, the systems themselves um, are supported. Okay, so we know this isn't new, right? How many people expected that policymakers were using data? or that the, the figures from your paper are constantly being put in front of um, somebody to make a justification for maybe if we're really good and we're out there, but how frequently are those are your figures being used, is being taken from your papers and put into to policy arenas? Um, and I would say we, we have this issue, which I think we know well in this group, though I don't think it's acknowledged that well outside of this group, that we have this process of, of collecting data, processing data, analyzing the data, and publishing the paper. And then that question of how does it get over to this, to this governance structure, in my case, into international ocean governance. And not just international ocean governance, but also corporate needs, right? I've had a lot of interaction over the last year uh, with extractive industries who would like to do better, if we want to believe them or not, um, but the not, they have the same problem, right? They're expected to go to the, to the data warehouse or to collect their own data and come up with that knowledge themselves. I agree that they should be doing that, but why is it that the information uh, that we're gathering about where biodiversity is, isn't more accessible to them to be able to utilize within their systems? Um, and I know a lot of the work being done here is, is meant to, to do that, uh, which is why this is a great place. Um, 
right? And, and yes, we, we, do, we do contribute to repositories. But what we need are these sort of bridging consortia, like NASP, uh, um, like what I hope MICO uh, will become. We need these entities that will, take, that will do the syntheses, pull the, the knowledge together, and start aggregating the knowledge and getting the knowledge out there in actionable formats, uh, rather than relying on somebody to come and take your data or read your papers. Okay, so that's what, that's what MICO is trying to be. It's trying to be one of these consortia. It's a, it is a group, a growing group of uh, over 50 organizations at this point. Um, uh, really importantly, BirdLife International is a major partner. Um, IUCN, uh, um, the Connectivity Conservation Group has just, um, yeah, has just been uh, um, brought on board. Um, and the people working on important marine mammal areas. As, so this is a consortium of uh, data repositories, national observing systems, taxa conservation groups, museum, environmental NGOs, universities, intergovernmental commission and commissions, and UN conventions. Um, right. So we're trying to be complementary. I'm not trying to put data repositories down. I, if people come to give us data, I ask them to put it in the data, data repository. We would like to take data from data repositories and utilize it in our system. Um, same thing with national observatories. We're trying to be value added to these, these organizations. Uh, and that's a really critical part of this. It's being led here at UQ and also um, back where I came from at Duke University. Um, and the funding mostly to, to date has come from the German government through the International Climate Initiative, which actually also has a biodiversity component, even though it's not in the name. So that I suggest anybody who hasn't looked there, it's a, it's a great resource for um, big lots of money. Okay, some critical aspects of, of MICO. Um, if the, this isn't clear already, if we're, we're trying to aggregate data, uh, not trying to, uh, trying to aggregate knowledge, not trying to aggregate um, data. Uh, and in the same sense, we don't disseminate data. We do actually take contributions of data or we take them from um, data repositories, but we're not giving that back out. And that kind of gets us around some of the issues that we've had with data sharing, right? Mm -hmm. I, I would like people to contribute data so that we can create standardized products from it. Those data will never see the light of day on the other side. Um, so what that allows is that researchers who are still trying to sort of, you know, the basic currency that we have of our data, you don't have to lose that to get a product out into the system now that can help inform policy and, uh, um, and area-based planning or EIAs. Um, provides a, a, a um, freely available standardized summary products. These are the area-based models and the um, network models that I'll show you in a second. Um, tracks those products and reports back to the contributors so that the contributors can go back to their funders and their universities and show how their information is actually feeding up into these systems. That may be the hardest part of the system to, to put together. Um, and it's designed to be modular <coughs> so that we can take on one animal at a time and add it to the current populations that we have without having to go back and redo the, the entire process for each of these. Um, populations and <clears throat> transparent. So um, the data um, it's attributed directly back to the the data holders. So you know who the original data holders were and if those data sets are available. Um, the methods um, are uh, online uh, and the scripts should actually be in GitHub very soon. Um, one of the things that I'm thinking about in terms of taking this forward is to decentralize this a little bit and let other people start developing these products and contributing them. We still need them in a standardized manner, uh, so we're hoping that people who use um, the scripts uh, to create the products, but it doesn't have to be me that's, that's doing that. It can't be me. Okay, so this is the fun part and the unwise part where I'm going to try to do the live demo of the tool. <laughs> All right, so if you go to, to um, myco.eco um, and then click on a link or myco.eco slash system, this is what you'll get to. <clears throat> this, is, um, this is probably the oldest part of the mapper right now. Uh, we wanted to try to create some general summaries that we could show to policymakers who weren't really going to interact with the mapper all that much. Um, I've showed this to a lot of policymakers. It's very difficult to get feedback from them about reporting and how this could better suit their needs. Um, but it's meant to provide general information about the overall system. And there are three ways of getting into the system. Um, migratory species, um, EEZs, and uh, um, contributors. So you can search by any of those. Um, in this case, we're gonna jump into the migratory species. I should say this was launched in April of this year, and we had a major update in um, September, October. Uh, so I'm gonna do this first one here, which is ancient murelet. 
And this is the sort of information that we're trying to get out to policymakers. Um, it tells you how much data we have, how many animals. This is all based on telemetry at the moment, but the system is meant to be able to incorporate telemetry, stable isotopes, genetics, marker capture, and acoustic, right? Anything that can inform connectivity. If you've got another one that can inform connectivity, we'll throw it in there too. But at this point, it's largely based on telemetry data and a literature review of telemetry papers. Um, and it has information about how the species, um, the EEZs that it covers, and the portion of the, the animal's range that, uh, that an EEZ covers. Um, that's a work in progress. The fun part is the mapper. So as I said, there are kind of two elements to this. Uh, one is work. Anybody who wants to sit down afterwards can, can look at that with me. <laughs> Not sure why the slow internet came at this point in time. Not a problem. Be prepared. OK, so there, there are kind of two elements to what we're trying to, to put together. One is network models. Um, so these are based on telemetry data. Um, this is a, um, a ancient murrelet breeds off of northwest uh, um, uh, North America. Um, and has a, a post-breeding molting stage where it goes up to the Bering Sea. From there, they either go west, uh, maybe half of them, less than half, go west, and their other half come back and overwinter um, back in the, um, in the eastern Pacific again. And then they take a completely different migration route back to the, to the breeding ground. Uh, so it's meant to convey that connectivity first and, and, and foremost. That's the first thing you'll see when you, when you open up a particular species. If you click on um, a node, uh, or if you click on the, the, the connectivity layer, or if you click on any node, the actual area use model generated from the same data will pop up underneath it. Um, these are generated, uh, um, yeah, so uh, the area use models will come up underneath it. In this case, yellow is breeding, and the blue are the overwintering um, areas, or the non-breeding areas. If you click on any individual, um, node, it will come up with information about the number of individuals, the description of the activity happening in that area, the papers that have been associated um, with that node, and that's all um, generated dynamically by the information that's uh, put into the system. Um, the fun part for me is that uh, it has sort of an even more in-depth version of what you saw on that front page, uh, which is it tells you the number of species by year that we're, you know, number of animals by year that we're using. Um, the, the different stages of migration by month, right? So we've got breeding again in yellow, happens entirely between March and June, uh, migration between July and November, um, and then back to the, or, you know, to the non breeding grounds. Um, in this case, we actually know them by population, so it's got the information about a number of animals by each of the populations and by um, sex. Um, uh, another sort of work in progress is thinking about how you can just click on an EEZ and it will come up with all the species that we have for that EEZ and information about all the species uh, um, for that EEZ. Um, so to date, we have uh, about seven or eight, um, uh, so it, it, this is a, a prototype at this point, we have about seven or eight um, species uh, in the system that have those area use models. I think we'll have another two or three in the next month or two. Um, and we have about 20 of these network models. Um, the network models are largely based on uh, information from the literature review. Um, so they, they, we can do it with the telemetry data, but we also have this massive 1,300 pa paper literature review. All of that is being geo-referenced so it can go into the system. Once that tranche of data gets put into the system, we'll sort of move from this prototype to a really functional system that can, that can um, inform things in a way that current systems can't. Uh, Right. So, and, and also, they do a really interesting job. Um, anybody who's worked with telemetry data and uh, tele um, telemetry tags knows that we can't tag everything, right? So sometimes if you only look at tag, tag data, you're going to miss a lot of species. Uh, and in this case, um, we need to use these other tag types to inform the gaps. Um, so that's why next steps are to move on to marker capture, um, stable isotopes, acoustics, and genetics to sort of fill in those, those gaps and put them all together in um, integrated uh, network models. 
Okay. Um, so please check the system out. Stay with me afterwards, and we'll reboot this, and I can show you what it looks like dynamically. It, it's a, a little more fun. It actually moves around. Um, uh, and the, the development of this has all been done by a guy named A. Fujioka at Duke University, who's one of these guys who, um, you know, one of the reasons the system might not be in, uh, working at the, at the second, though I think it's just the internet, is that he's constantly putting new things into the system. So every time I turn it on, I'm a little bit scared as to what's actually going to be there, because he just likes to put new things in it. Um, so it's, it's pretty fun to work with. So there's something, I want to just reiterate this, this point again. There's something going on here, right? So we've got Myco, and you've heard my rant about trying to move towards um, aggregating knowledge. And it's not, it, Myco is not the only place, the only thing doing this, right? I know this, is, this happens on the terrestrial side in various ways, but it's happening on the marine side as well. Um, important marine mammal areas and important bird areas are really good examples of this. Key biodiversity areas are, are uh, an example of this. Um, and there's this thing going on, right? And it just coming back to this, this final point and reiterating that you know, this idea that data is generating action is not the case. The data is not going to generate the action. Um, there, are, there are obstacles between budgets and capacity and time. They're simply not going to allow that to happen. We, we know this schematic. We know this diagram, right? That data goes to knowledge or data goes to information to knowledge, if you prefer. Um, and that that is what's going to lead to to action. And this is the thing that I think the sea change that's happening right now, at least on the in the marine area-based management side, is this change from shift from starting to from aggregating data to trying to aggregate that knowledge. Um, and what I'm very interested in in pursuing. So if you'd like to to participate, plug. Um, there's a lot of ways to 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 join. This system so far has been essentially based entirely on the backs of students. This is not my work, okay? This is sort of my third child that I oversee and I try to like bring back into the center of the room on occasion, but this is the work of a lot of, a lot of uh, students and, and research staff. Um, uh, in particular, I'm excited that honor student is actually starting in three days, so she hasn't actually started, but she's about to jump into the mix here, um, but largely been done by master students and PhD, one PhD student, um, but largely the master's students, um, as well as a, as a number of research staff who do the web development and things like that. The 50 plus micro partners are mostly contributors and advisors. So again, this, is, this isn't done by you know, eminent researchers. This is done by people in this room. Um, so the ongoing opportunities, connectivity, literature review, um, we, we, this is just the basic, the, the smallest scraping of the surface of the knowledge that's out there. And we really need to go back and get the knowledge that's out there and put it into a system before it's lost entirely. Um, movement and area use models. Uh, I was really excited that Ross Dwyer is here and I'm hoping to work with him some more. Um, and, um, uh, and also thinking about the network models and how to move those network models. Um, there's a lot of unknowns here. How do we integrate across really disparate data types into one single network model um, uh, with a very different um, sort of uh, error uh, compositions? Um, and then, um, and finally, putting all of this into an international rent policy context. Uh, you know, I think there's room for everybody from uh, um, hardcore R fanatics, would love to meet you, uh, to folks interested in social science and how we actually develop actionable knowledge. I've been asked what right I have to do this, which is a reasonable question and, and things we need to think about. How this system can be better developed for indigenous uh, culture so that we can get um, traditional ecological knowledge into the system. Again, important, and the system can totally handle it. We just need to think about it and try to figure it out. Which leads to the final point, which is that this has all been done on a five-year funding cycle, which is running towards the end. Uh, and right now, my main effort is to try to find the next thing, that the next effort, the next uh, tranche of funds that is going to support moving this from this uh, prototype system and, and scaling it up. Um, we have a lot of information that's about to get into the system, and we really need to take that next step um, and integrate it better and move on to these other data types. Um, so I'd be really excited to talk to folks about uh, next step uh, proposal development on where this can go and who we can talk to next. Okay, thank you. I think I was relatively on time. I have no idea. Yeah. That's an incredible amount of work. And very, very inspiring. Just like even that that much information exists and all those pieces is mm -hmm. really amazing. And I was interested, like you pointed out, that there's the turtle database and that's not being updated. What's your like insurance policy for this? Yeah. 
I don't have one right now. Um, so this is, it's actually funny that I'm in this spot because maybe 10 years ago, maybe eight or nine years ago, we wrote a paper about how ecosystem-based management tools would fail without changes in funding structures. Um, so you can go check it out. You can make me eat my words, or not eat my words, but say like, why the hell did you do this when you knew what the problem was? And all of those systems, basically all of, all of the tools that we have, almost to the last one, are based on the hero structure. Right? If there's not an individual who believes in it, who continues to push it, um, they don't last. Um, one way that I'm trying to get around that right now is that for the first three years of work on MICO, we were focused on governance. Um, and governance arenas, particularly international governance arenas, they have no money. I mean, it's half the reason that it's easy to get information into the systems, because they need it. They don't, they, they don't have any money to do it themselves. The Convention on Migratory Species has a mandate to develop a global atlas of animal migration. They have zero dollars to do it, right? So I was there last week to get MICO into resolutions because they're very happy to have MICO as a node, but they're not gonna give any money to do it. So what's happened in the last year is that I kind of realized that the same information that we're generating is really useful to um, industry as well. And that there's no reason that we couldn't use a more industry-oriented funding structure. So I've gone to Cambridge and talked to the people who run IBAT, um, the, Internet, the Integrated Biodiversity Assessment Tool, um, and the Proteus Partners, who are um, oil and gas and mining um, companies that work with WCMC, the Rural Conservation Monitoring Center, um, to use them as consultants, use the data sets that aren't really theirs that they pull together um, uh, to feed into, their, into these systems. Um, to see if, if how we can build out MICO so that it could fit into that funding structure that may actually produce regular, not returns, but regular input into the system. Um, so that's my hope right now. Um, I'm working on a linkage grant. I've got one of these burst um, uh, grants at the moment to work with uh, the Proteus partners, and then I hope that leads to an ARC uh, ARC linkage grant next year. But it, it is a big question. Thanks very much, Dan. This is brilliant stuff. Um, do you, is, is the fundamental basis of MICO to meta analyze individual data sets, or does it sort of meta synthesize products that people have made? Do you understand what I'm yeah. asking? Yeah. Um, we've gone back and forth on this a little bit, and the question is how easy is it to standardize across um, non standard model results? And so far, we have not hold on board other people's models um, because it's particularly things like kernel density estimates, like the polygons can range incredibly based on your smoothing factor, right? And there's it, an, an accepted form of making those kernel density estimates is just to move the smoothing factor until it looks somewhat like you like, <laughs> which is insane. Uh, but it is a common method, right? So how do you integrate models that are developed that way? So I think our preference at this point is really to have a standard approach to developing the products. So, so I guess then the follow-up question, and obviously the challenge you thought about, is what, what about when your analysis differs from that of the specialized team of researchers that have spent 20 years studying a particular yeah. species and you come in with your more generalized approach mm -hmm. um, and it comes up with a very different answer. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so one, I should say that um, we run the products by the contributors before it go back out. So there's going to be a response process. We've run into situations already. Um, stupidly, somehow we decided wandering albatross might be a good, because we knew Henri Wimmer's and we're like, okay, he'll give us these data. This is great. Um, anybody know the distribution of wandering albatrosses? It's like everywhere, their foraging areas are like enormous. The trying to identify a stopover site is silly. Um, so they are not a good candidate for this. Uh, and, and the foraging areas that we came up with didn't look like his foraging areas. And so far those haven't made it into the system because we don't exactly know what to do in, with that behavior. So I think, I think there's, it's an iterative process. We're not gonna put things up that the, the um, experts who provided the data don't agree with. Thanks for that. Um, kind of related to that question, or like the wandering albatross example, how have you dealt with sort of the definition of migratory versus mobile versus just really widely dispersed? Yeah. Like is that a problem 
talk about it? Um, yes. Uh, so um, I didn't put it up here, but we had a, a paper come out um, late last year in September on the importance of migratory connectivity to um, global ocean governance. And um, uh, it's in proceedings B, happy to throw and pass it around. Um, and <laughs> when we tried to write that paper without defining migration, and we, we've tried to do, we tried to run the entire project up until that point without defining migration, because in fact, half the species that we have currently listed, whether or not they have data in the system, are, you would have a hard time describing as migratory in a sort of seasonal cyclical manner. Um, there's no question that they move over large distances and they do it regularly, but whether they do it in a, you know, that same manner um, is difficult to say. Um, so we have had problems with that. We did define it, um, and, uh, but we, we haven't been applying a specific definition to the animals. In the end, I'm happy to put in nomadic, mig migratory, whichever kind you want. If we can, if we can identify behaviors and identify um, areas associated with those behaviors, uh, that's fine by me. So we have, and we have an example, we have examples of that already, sea turtles. Um, again, really stupidly, we started with loggerhead sea turtles, which if anybody knows loggerheads, they're one of the few sea turtles that'll just basically eat anything, which means they just kind of go anywhere half the time. And so we have some ranging areas that aren't, you know, you wouldn't describe as part of a migratory cycle. So at some point, somebody might argue that the name of the system is inappropriate, but um, the information in the system is, uh, I think, is useful. Maybe that's, I mean, that's an important part of knowledge is like understanding where there's competing knowledge mm -hmm. and confusion. So maybe having something like that that indicates disputed ranges or disputed definitions of whether this species should be in the database yeah. like, would be useful to people as well. Yeah, maybe. I mean, there's, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty fraught area and, and the people that I mean, like conventional migratory species being the, the best example, right? They have, they have a, a solid definition that they don't abide by, yeah. right? Um, there are loads of species that aren't in there that would qualify, and there are species that are in there that are highly questionable. Yeah. Uh, so it's, um, I, I'm not sure, I've kind of felt that it doesn't really help to dig too far into it. It's, it's more of an academic thing than, yeah. than the information that we're developing, which is yeah. more applied and sort of like, here you go, this is what we know for this species. Yeah, no, I was just asking if like, that was gonna, if people were going to not recognize the value of this because, because it's of the migratory. And the yeah, yeah. yeah. I think for the most part, people have just shortened it now. And so yeah. it's just. Hopefully, it'll turn into many acronyms that people don't think about. Yeah. It's yeah. Maybe we'll go from like uh, the, the tagging of ocean uh, pelagics or whatever it was, tops changed its name to predators so that it could be more sexy or something like that. So maybe we'll have to do that at some point. Yeah. That'll be fine. I would love to have that problem in five years' time where people are like, this is far bigger than you're thinking. Um, yeah. You mentioned earlier that usually this data repositories and tools are not used by decision makers mm -hmm. because you don't know that they exist. Um, and I think this might be a reason that most of those tools are being de developed without co-development of decision makers and stakeholders. And I was wondering um, how many of your stakeholders that you have, your 50 people that are mm -hmm. advising, are actually proper decision makers who are yeah. going to use your research outputs? Yeah, um, great question. So we have an advisory board that has three components to it. And one of it is a policy advisory panel. And um, on that policy advisory panel are, are people from UNESCO. Uh, they're more from the secretariat side than the delegation side. And that's just a matter of who we know. Um, but we're hoping that they're pulling information from uh, delegations, um, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to actually uh, bring on more you know, people who are actually doing the national reporting as opposed to those secretaries. But we have um, UNESCO, uh, we have um, Conventional Migratory Species, not just the, the secretary, but the MOU for sea turtles, the MOU for sharks, um, and I'm missing another one, the Global Atlas uh, people as well. Um, we have the Sargasso Sea Commission, um, so we have a number of, of sort of policymakers, 10 on that list, uh, maybe more than 10. Um, and it's time to sort of turn them over as well. So it's time to try to bring in some, some more folks um, into yeah. the process And that well. would be key for phase two, to just yeah. expand your set of what your stakeholders, decision makers. Yeah, absolutely. It's midday, so maybe we should let Daniel off the book. I saw Matt had his hand up, but maybe he can. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was very inspiring. Thank you.